All right, everybody, welcome back from break. Um, it is now two o'clock my time, but I guess four o'clock according to these slides. Um, welcome to the fourth session of Game RT's March mini conference on TTRPGs in the libraries. My name is Amber Sewell. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a current member at large for Game RT and I'm on the program planning committee. Um, I also work as a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. This session will run from now until 4.45, yeah, even though this is two here, and then it's being recorded and live streamed to Twitch. All recordings of sessions will be available on our Twitch channel after the event. Copies of the slides for presentations are linked in the conference group resource doc, which will be linked in chat. For this session, we'll have two shorter presentations followed up by a Q&A. If you have questions for the presenters, please let us know who that question is for, and please use the Zoom Q&A chat function. Um, if you've never used the Zoom Q&A chat feature before, please see the note about that that's being added to the chat. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, our tech team will snag your questions to add to the Zoom Q&A. All that said, let's get started. Um, our first presenter is Jesse Mixon with Kits of Lending, developing take-home D&D kits. Hi, Amber and everyone. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to present here for you today. Uh, get this screen share up. And we're going to be talking about my library, Library West at the University of Florida's new custom D&D &D take home kits that we added to our library of things. So here we go. All right. Okay. So just a short overview. We're going to be going through pretty quick. This is a five minute presentation. Basically, I had the advantage of being a longtime gamer, and when I was put in charge of my library's uh, game collection, I noticed a need and then was able to assemble a team to develop the kits, get some funding, and then make them. So, you know, like any forever DM, I made a spreadsheet. Um, when I took over the game collection we have here at Library West, I noticed an increase just practically in the library of the interest in Dungeons and Dragons. This was something I knew from my personal life. But as you can see here, we've got some stats to back it up. There are millions of people interested in playing simply just fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, never mind any other type of tabletop. However, in the University of Florida's area, Gainesville, Florida, Alachua County, there were very few opportunities for players over the age of 18 to participate unless they purchased their own materials or knew someone. That was pretty much it. You had to know someone or be willing to go play with strangers in designated times and spaces, possibly without any preparation beforehand, which was an unnecessary barrier to something we had a lot of patrons asking about. So decided to see what other libraries were doing. As a player in DM, I thought about what I would want, what's the bare essentials, what's expensive. That was the other big thing. Play 5e, you know how expensive those books can get. Uh, the other important thing was what types of kits were being able to leave the building. Looking at peer institutions, we found the local public libraries did have campaign books for Lind, but no materials. So if you wanted shiny math rocks, you're still out of luck. Uh, looking wider online, searching through WorldCat, just checking what other libraries around the world had to offer. We found custom kits like what I was imagining to be pretty rare. Most places would circulate the official D&D &D starter or essentials kits. And if you just needed something for an individual, you could get the whole group kit and take it for yourself. Um, our library has a set of directives and any new project or addition to a project also has to meet with those directives. These kits very neat, fit very neatly in because we already lend games. They focused on diversifying the types of games and resources we had for our patrons, as well as promoting patron wellness. Although UF has an academic library, we do have resources for more than just studying here. And this would expand my branches game collection and add a game collection to our other large uh, science library, which has a high undergraduate population. 
Um, initially just pitched this as a routine purchase request. I made up my little charts, took them to my supervisor and said, hey, can we just add these same as we would another game? And they were like, you've got a lot of support, apply for funding. So UF has internal grant opportunities linked here. You can see in the PowerPoints, we have one that is currently on hiatus, but at the time was open the strategic opportunity grant for adding new types of technology. We got to work with the grant committee and they were fantastic in helping refine our application process based on the support that we had from inside and outside the library. They encouraged us to do a lot more kits and a lot more money and to go from that initial pitch, which was just adding games to Library West to adding games to West and Marston, our other branch. Uh, we ended up focusing on how this compared to other, sorry, someone in the hall, um, comparable projects at peer institutions, as well as what our pitch would stand out in the individuals and the customization and just really emphasizing the patron interest. Because of that, we had letter support from librarians, researchers, students. There was actually a limit on letters of support, but we even had other community members who were willing to write us letters if we were allowed to attach more. Because of that, we ended up with more than $4,000 in 80 total kits. Um, I had a huge pile of dice at my desk when we were assembling these, so that was great. <laughs> and this is what all of that money went into. Uh, we have three types of kits for our players. The individual kits uh, have gotten a lot of interest already. We have the adventurer kit for individual players, just the player's handbook and some dice. The DM kit, all of the dice in a lovely box, if I do say so myself. Two seven piece sets, as well as a 66 set, because the DM is going to be rolling a lot. And then we do have the party kits for small groups that have the essential kit in them, but we added again more dice for the ability to just really hit the ground running. It was important for us that we had a variety of options to address the different types of needs that patrons might have rather than just focusing on any one type group of gamer. And so any patron can come in and start playing regardless of their experience, resources, however many people they have with them. As we note here, we do have a bunch of blank character sheets. So if you've got a bunch of people you just wanna write up, you need an extra one, take what you need and the kit inserts that have the barcodes for scanning out. On the reverse, have a bunch of tips for our student gaming organization, as well as how to sign up for D&D Beyond, Roll20, Albert Rodeo, Discord, all of that good stuff. As for what we hope to do next, um, D&D kits, based on just the conversations we had, really highlighted how good they were for showing library spaces and collaborating with other groups. We have maker spaces in some of our libraries, including Marston, and hope to be able to have prop making and customization workshops, as well as gameplay workshops, highlighting our recreation spaces, letting people know it's not all quiet floors, maybe allowing the gaming organization to host events here. And if the interest holds, which is pretty new, but I can't imagine it won't. We would love to add more materials, like I wrote here, maps, small press games, campaign books, things like that. Um, and yeah, again, academic university spreadsheets. We'll be working with the University of Florida's Assessment Advisory Committee to get some cool hard data on how patrons like it. But yeah, that's what we did. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. That sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see what questions come in about that. Um, the presenters for the next presentation are unable to be here due to storms in Arkansas right now, but they will be recording their presentation next week, and it will be added to the conference documents for viewing later. And um, that presentation is session negative one, character creation and community building firsthand experience by Dominique Hallett and Sarah Wolford. If you happen to be watching the recording of this, look at the conference program outline document for the recording of this presentation.
Um, in place of this presentation today, we will be showing off the group document for this conference after the Q&A session for this presentation block. Um, and now for our final presentation, Repair to Play in Dungeons and Dragons by Giuseppe Femia. All right, uh, let me just get the share screen going up. Uh, Cool. Right. Go. Hi. Hi. So my name is Giuseppe Femia, and I'm here. Uh, well, I'm from the University of Waterloo in Canada, and I'm here to talk about repair to play in Dungeons and Dragons today. This repair to play is a concept that I've been heralding for about four years now, and I'm really excited to bring it to Game RT. Um, but let's just jump into it. All right. So, so one of the main issues that is uh, is coming with our culture is as queer identities continue to be ma marginalized in our contemporary culture, uh, the spaces for queer discourse in most media are limited. Um, this is a picture uh, taken from a scene of the Owl House where uh, both Amity and Luz are kind of more explicitly come out as uh, lesbian. And this is the main example that I tell people uh, to show them the limited ability members of the queer community have to represent themselves um, and their values in mainstream media. Now, that being the case, there is space uh, within pre-existing narratives that can be used to interpret the stories we see more generously to accommodate uh, for queer values. Uh, this observation uh, has come to be known as reparative reading. Now, Eve Kasasi Sedgwick uh, first proposed the idea of reparative reading in the mid 90s. At its core, reparative reading places focus on a positive framing of a story with the intention of constructing a more optimistic view for our queer future. A reparative reading focuses not on the exposure of political outrages that we already know about, but rather the process of reconstructing a sustainable life. Um, in other words, we rebuild our immediate surroundings and our belief in a future. For the queer community, reparative reading is a frame through which we can see and access progressive representation, which positively frames our values within narratives. Now, uh, Sedgwick's reparative reading uh, of In Search of Lost Time uh, points out how it would not have been possible for the narrator to take joy in the truths that he came across if he were being held back by a heterotypical family. So uh, the narrator, after a long withdrawal from society, goes to a party where he at first thinks everyone is sporting elaborate costumes, pretending to be ancient, and then realizes that they are old and so is he, and is then assailed in half a dozen distinct mnemonic shocks by a climactic series of joy-inducing truths about the relation of writing to time. The narrator never says so, but isn't it worth pointing out that the complete temporal disorientation that initiates him into this revelatory space would have not been possible in a heterosexual pair de famille, in one, if in, 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 so to say, in the form of inexorably progressing identities and roles, the regular arrival of children and grandchildren. This reparative reading reframes the idea of the heterotypical family as restrictive and favors an alternative to this heteronormative value. Uh, similarly, the reparative reading of queer characters in ideal situations allows us to see changes we can make in our own world to bring these ideas to fruition. Now, here's where I get to the game part of it. Here we go to reparative play we can observe that it has some similar aspects to reparative reading as a frame of interpretation, but its focus as an object text is performance centered around queerness. Reparative play, like reparative reading, is an idealistic interpretation of the story that transpires framing queer values. Unlike reparative reading, which lacks a performative aspect, reparative play is enacted by queer performativity so that the player is healing by exacting their autonomy through their actions. Through queer performativity, members of the queer community have the chance to actively represent themselves, uh, ourselves, and overwrite the more harmful stereotypes that are associated with us. 
by formulating psychological problems and solutions for both the characters and their players and showing how they fail or succeed in the actions they take. The enactment of particular values and behaviors can be experienced and rhetorically reinforced. This frame of play creates a rhetorical discourse that can help the players reimagine the world in a positive light, changing how they view their positionality in and alongside the world's problems. Electra Dia Cliambriano uh, notes that reality is not objective, but socially constructed, and thus having narratives is our way of maintaining and organizing our personal reality and making sense of our experiences. In line with this rhetorical view of the world, Reparative play constructs progressive narratives with the experiential reading of it affords players through the performance. Role play is one such activity that uh, provides an opportunity to create our own progressive discourse through this frame. Sometimes role play can be found in theater, but more recently it has been popularized through role playing games. Dungeons and Dragons, or D&D, is the most popular RPG to date and is considered a common pastime for people all over the world. However, for some, it is more than just a game. D&D helps people in ways that many of us don't even realize. So I, I had this slide up before I saw some of the other presentations uh, that came up today. And I keep hearing the question why D&D &D in my own uh, university, and I have to keep justifying it, but I feel like everybody has a really good understanding here why D&D &D is so important. Uh, and this kind of like brings up like, yeah, D and D is important. It is a means of creating a story. It is a very involved process, but more importantly, it is popular. Um, while previous versions of the games have been restrictive with their characters creation affordances like class requirements and race options, newer editions make diverse character options more accessible. Uh, the fifth edition of the game's free-flowing rules and heavy reliance on world building contributes two key elements towards the act of reparative play. One, it affords individuals the room to craft their own stories within a greater arching narrative. And two, it encourages the use of personalized characters, often avatars of the player, as a way for them to exist in a safe space. As such, the positionality and purpose with which a player approaches the game will heavily influence the reparative play they experience from it. When they take part in the improvised experience of the game, they are given the autonomy to act and present themselves however they please while exploring queer themes. Through this freedom, the role-playing aspect of D&D can be used as a productive and entertaining tool to facilitate reparative play. D&D's popularity makes the game a unique space in which queer characters can be written into existence in a mainstream medium. So, we already know this to be true because the rhetorical benefits of D&D have been reported on previously, even if the players didn't realize that they were already taking part in a form of reparative play. Uh, so, for example, very popular example, Taliesin Jade touches on reparative play with his bisexual gender fluid character Molly Mock Teeleaf on the D&D podcast Critical, Critical Role, uh, saying how it allows him to play out a life he had once considered for himself. And Joan Moriarty, in her article, How My Role-Playing Game Character Showed Me I Could Be a Woman, discusses at length how tabletop role-playing games were crucial to her journey of self-discovery. In a similar vein, game designer Josephine Baer describes the alibi that d, &D gave her to take part in her own gender performativity in high school. And Allie Beardsley, uh, in, her, in their portrayal of their trans character, Pete Conlon, on the D&D podcast Dimension 20, explores the life of a person who has gotten, undergone gender affirmation surgery before Beardsley underwent their own. For these reparative play examples, the stories of these character, characters helps to normalize the idea of queer characters for both the individual as well as the larger community uh, through their identification. Now, while the playing of the game has the potential to allow for shared space where the players can act more freely and more comfortably, uh, than they would be able to otherwise, this is not always a guarantee. As such, if we wish to employ reparative play effectively, we turn to certain scholars and game designers who have already developed tools to foster this form of play. These tools allow us to approach RPGs with the purpose of assisting players to accept their queer identity, allowing them to portray themselves as they see fit. Axiel Kasanov uh, brings up a strategy in making room for more gender exploration in role play through the use of pronouns. 
creating a world where every character is referred to as they, them, or every character can be referred to with any pronouns, he, her, she, her, he, him, she, her, they, them, makes room for those who wish to transcend the gender norms that their character could be constricted by. Additionally, the players might seek to create characters that work well together and are willing to help each other out in ways that help their meet their mental and socio-emotional needs. This too can aid in the reparative play that they are taking part in as everyone is looking for something and willing to help each other attain it. Kemper et al. Uh, goes into great detail with regard to how members of the marginalized community steer for survival, where they navigate the game in a manner that does not bring up any disparaging or insensitive subject matter. The way that this is often achieved is a practice known as session zero, where the group gathers before the play begins to discuss their boundaries and expectations, what they are okay with experiencing, and what they hope to achieve in the play. Session zero has become so common as the practice that it was included as part of the official guidelines in the D&D module Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft as a precaution to take for running a horror game safely. Session zero also assists in working towards the design goal and ensuring the sustainability of the endeavor. While events that violate the player's boundaries may never occur to begin with, this practice ensures everyone that there is not as often in the need to actively steer away from them as the group is obligated to maintain these rules. If these rules are broken, the dungeon master or the DM, uh, the player with the most authority, has the power to stop the game. However, if it comes to it, the players can enact their own agency and quit a game that they do not wish to be a part of anymore. One safety tool for these moments would be an X card placed on the table that a player can touch at any time to alert everyone to their discomfort. Now, Sarah Lynn Bowman uh, takes a typological approach to the character that a player might design, classifying them based on how the character is derived from aspects of the player. While there are trillions of possible variations in the characters that could be created, there are nine types that Bowman looks at relative to the player, which I believe would be ideal for repair to play. I do not have the space to go into detail with every one of these character types, uh, but it is uh, Sarah Lynn Bowman's um, The Functions of Role-Playing Games, if anyone wants to check that out. Very good read, highly recommend it. Uh, but the one um, typological uh, character type that sticks out to me is the doppelganger self. And I find that the doppelganger self is most useful when enacting the reparative play by telling one's own story. Uh, the doppelganger self is made to act and think like its player, as though the player has been put in the context the character finds itself in. This character type provides the player with more self-awareness of their own perspective than would typically be the case if a player were trying to figure out how a different character would act. And this is a very common character to make for beginners, as they would have an easier time navigating the world when they are not preoccupied with the dissonance that comes from a player's wants and a character's wants. Bowman, note, Bowman note notes that the similarity between the primary self and the persona can also work to enhance self-esteem, offering an ordinary person the ability to do extraordinary things and make a difference in a crisis situation. I found this particular character type uh, beneficial for when I decided to play an asexual furbold named Vander Anamson. That's the beefy boy on the right. Uh, Vander was the son of the giant god and was tasked with uniting the giant kingdoms. He was forced to marry one heir from each kingdom, and through this, I was able to create a new narrative for myself with Vander, and I tried, to, I, I treated each relationship like it was a queer platonic, instead of doing the whole yes and of improv, when another character flirted with me. So even though I was not romantically or sexually attracted to my partners in game, I was still able to be good friends with them, and that was more functional for me as a member of those relationships. Through this character, I created my own narrative where asexuality was approached as a positive alternative to the heteronormative ideal. And this benefited me greatly because I was able to create a piece of media in my own canon, at least, where the asexual character, like me, had a fulfilling existence without a sexual or romantic partner. Now, considering aspects of my identity this way aided in creating a character who was more attuned to the way I felt about the world. Having this type of self-representation gave me the rhetorical support that I needed, which modern media had failed to provide me. And I needed this to begin openly identifying as ace. And with that came a greater degree of fulfillment with my social relationships. 
My concluding thoughts on this topic is that reparative play is a very powerful rhetorical tool that can be used to the benefit of both the individual and their community through the active creation of queer narratives. So uh, thank you for listening to my work. My email and socials can be found there if you uh, want to get in contact with me. For those who are interested in seeing the media artifact me and my dungeon master have created as a byproduct of reparative play, you can go to kayamore.com or scan the QR code now. Um, this is basically a D&D based comic that has been seven years in the making, uh, uh, complete with short stories, voice acting and archive lore. And uh, you can get a pretty good idea of how D&D has been impacting the online spaces from this, even though I'm fairly certain that many at this uh, at this mini conference uh, already kind of understand where I'm coming from. So, yeah, so that's that. Uh, thank you all for coming out and listening. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for your presentations. Um, we are ready for the Q&A. So audience, if you would please add any questions you've got um, either on Twitch or in the chat or Q&A on Zoom. I know what I'm looking at. Um, so we already have a couple of questions. The first one is for Jesse. Have you thought of creating kits for indie RPG games with unique mechanics, like one with Jenga towers for Dread or Starcrossed or electric candles for 10 candles? Thank you so much. We actually already have a board game collection that patrons are able to borrow. We do not have any plans yet for other third party kits right now, but one of the advantages and the reason we emphasize so heavily having dice was that way if someone already had access to a third party kit, they could get access to dice. There are a few, I know, for example, one kit that is really high on my wish list is Coyote and Crow. Um, I would love if we could get that one um, and some of the others too, but uh, that that's one that I would really like to be able to circulate. Otherwise, we may end up adapting them based on the way we do our other library of things with our tech, where we have a core component that is here's what you're getting. And then you could, for example, pick which rule book you want to check out. Um, we're, our program's pretty new. It technically does not even have its full solid launch until the summer semester. Um, so it's kind of in its soft launch phase right now with all of the kits. But um, based on patron feedback, I would love to incorporate more combination kits and definitely more third party kits as well. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, for you, Seppi, what do you think would be useful for librarians to do or keep in mind to in make spaces that invite reparative play? Uh, so I highly recommend uh, giving some of the resources that I listed uh, a check just in terms of like the safety rules, X card, uh, brush up on uh, session zero, just make this space accommodating and allow for um, uh, the, the players to kind of have their own um, their own agency within how they identify, portray and play their character. Uh, there are there are limits to this where like if they like get to um, infighting with other people within the group, which is always a thing, but uh, just in terms of moderating it, give uh, them the benefit of the doubt that they know how to portray themselves uh, better than any piece of media uh, available. Um, but yeah, stuff like X card, stuff like uh, freedom agency of identification, um, session zero, all great things. Basically just checking in with them, the players themselves, asking them what they, would like to do what they'd like to accomplish in the game, um, but just keeping that dialogue open and not make not 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 shutting down any like idea that they might have in terms of uh, kind of performing their own queer values. Wonderful, thank you. And um, so, Jesse, we've got a couple of different questions that are around kind of like policy development um, for the kits. So. 
How often do pieces go missing and what are the plans for replacing those parts? Um, how long is the checkout? Do they typically come in okay? Um, kind, of, kind of policy and management questions. Sure, thank you. Um, so far, so good. Knock on wood for that. Uh, the different types of kits have different loan policies based on what's in them. So the party kits, the small groups kits, are available for 30 day loans because we all know how hard it is to schedule a session. And that way people just have a little bit more of a chance to try it out. We also have a renewal policy where as long as we have at least one other version of the same kit available, patrons can renew them again. If there's none, you have to bring them back in, but you can always try again the next day. Um, for the individual kits, they are seven day loans, but they have the same renewal policy. Uh, clear bags are a godsend because they mean that the patrons and circulation staff don't have to understand anything in the book. They just have to read my insert. See, there are seven things in this bag. There are seven things on this sheet. I'm good, throw it in and go from there. So far, that's all worked out well. Our library of things does have a standing policy where if a patron did lose or damage something, they do agree to be liable for replacement costs for that. But we do try and minimize that work with them because the goal is to get the kits to them. So as long as it's still playable, we, we try not to stress too much. And so far, nothing's been lost. So wish me luck. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it's going well so far. Um, Recipe, there are a lot of different types of safety tools out there. What do you think folks should do, should brush up on first, or do you have one that you really like having at the table? Sorry to meet her there. I guess that in, in terms of like, uh, I guess it's not so much something to brush up on, but maybe ex maybe expand the horizons for what you believe a session zero to be. I think that session zero is the very like hard set uh, formal uh, meeting in which uh, all the rules and all the all the social rules can be put into place. Uh, the players can talk about their triggers. They can talk about what they want to achieve in the game. Um, there's a lot of helpful uh, materials online for running a session zero um, like there are checklists and um, uh, things that you might be able to prompt from the players just to give them overall the best experience uh, that it can be afforded but yeah that session zero is my favorite tool it's the one that I use the most in terms of like governing uh, the campaign and how exactly uh, my players want to uh, navigate the world and uh, do stuff and explore themes. Um, so yeah, just uh, look at what other people have been doing with session zero and that would be insanely helpful. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jesse, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you determined what types of kits that you would offer, how you decided on the three and then how many of each you were gonna make available. Sure, definitely. So initially, like I said, it was a very small proposal and just me kind of sneaking around looking at everyone else like, okay, who has what, what's available, and hazarding guesses based on my knowledge of the community and being a longtime player. So I was like, individual kits, the the number one thing is we need to have more players than DMs because you will always, without fail, have more people who, oh, I want to drop in. I want to start as a player. I did start. My very first uh, TTRPG experience ever was I was like, hey, everybody, we're in four different time zones. What if uh, I ran a game of Pathfinder and we made spreadsheets and Google Docs, which is an experience that will either make you like me now or burn you from TTRPGs forever. Most people don't do that for very good reason. So whatever proportion we had, the most had to be individual players. Um, doing a two to one ratio with DMs seemed pretty reasonable because again, originally I was thinking maybe I'll get 15, 20 if I'm really lucky and they're like really sold on this. Um, and then for the small groups, because it's kind of combining both of them, I was like, 
okay, 10, five, five. And then the grant committee was like, you've got a lot of support already for your preliminary meeting. Double this. And if you can get another branch to sign on, double that for both of you, which is how we went from 15 to 80. So the initial ratios were based on just, okay, what are patrons most likely to ask for? And how many do you have of any one player type in a game? And then the expansion was based on the letters of support that we had from inside and outside the libraries. Excellent. And just to kind of follow up on that, uh, you've mentioned that the administration like knew you had support. Is this something where they were your supporters were going directly to admin? Were you collecting their feedback? Um, were you like, wink, wink, if you want this to happen, let, let, let the people know? A little bit of both. So as part of our grant application, we did have people write formal letters of support that were included with our application and were just attached, stapled in, compressed into a PDF, all of that good stuff sent along with them. They were really touching. We had one student talk about how important it was to have games and D&D &D in particular as a break from their studies and how it really helped them build friendships and settle into new balance at the university. That was one of our really strong ones, um, as well as people doing research into D&D with their PhD programs here. So we had a lot of unique perspectives that people were willing to write like physical letters for. But we also had informal support where people were just going and talking to supervisors and being like, hey, this is really interesting. I really like the sound of this. Uh, we documented any conversations we had with patrons when talking about our game collection. They're like, well, do you have this kind of game? And as part of our statistics, we jot any kind of reference question or patron interest down in our stats system. And so the increase in questions about games also helped show administration that we had sustained interest even beyond again we were actually only limited we could only have three official letters of support um but we had a lot of statistics plus anecdotal like information that we could say okay i've told my supervisor here's all of the information we get and then they say this so it kind of got funneled into you know 15 positive patron conversations translates into uh, support from direct supervisor turns into this. So somewhere between, I don't know, a DBZ fusion and a Pokemon evolution, they just kind of blended together. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you. Um, for you, Seppi, we had a question. As noted, scheduling can be hard. Can session zero be on the same day as the first session, or is it best to be separate? Uh, that would really depend on how long your uh, your sessions run. For people who run sessions of like six hours or more, it could potentially. I always believe that the session zero should happen alongside or before character creation. Like you can have it where people bring their own characters uh, to the game or they've made them with you ahead of time. But session zero lays not lays down not just the social rules, but also like the themes with which you might want to explore. And some characters just don't vibe well together. You always have the, the idea of the edgy uh, rogue who just wants to go off and do their own thing. And that doesn't work well with the team synergy or kind of exploring uh, values or themes in the way that other players at the table might want to explore. So uh, what I recommend doing is if you have enough time, uh, getting everyone together, ask them what themes they want to explore, have like a bulletin board or something, write down these one by one. In uh, one of the previous uh, the campaigns that I started, I wanted to, uh, 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 Right. I wanted to explore disability, so I worked with the DM. And one of the things that he, uh, that was done is like, we want to do disability, we want to do romance, we want to do family. These are the themes. These are what we're going to be working with. These are how we're going to be constructing the campaign with these themes in mind. Then you can create your characters. 
And if you can do that all in the same day as your characters and then still play the, out the first session, that's great. Uh, I wouldn't do it if you can't allot that amount of time for it, uh, because I, I do think that session zero should be something that precedes character creation and campaign creation. Because if you already come to the table with a D&D character in mind, it, it makes it harder for you to shift gears to adjust to what the themes you want to explore. If the DM comes to the table with a preset campaign idea in mind, it's also going to be hard for him or her or they to backtrack or adjust themselves to fit the new themes, the new, uh, the new social uh, values that people want to explore. And that is entirely, uh, uh, that's, that, that's, the, that's kind of the entire point of the session zero, I think. So I, I guess what I'm saying is you can do it, but it needs to precede uh, character creation and campaign creation. Awesome, thank you. Um, I was typing in chat, I'll just say it since I'm unmuted. Uh, but yes, I like at most to have the introduction scene. So as a DM, you can see how the characters are gonna interact. But like Danielle mentioned, I like doing the session one separate. Um, let's see. For Jesse, have you thought of including safety tools in the kits or maybe even instructions on how to run a session zero? Yes, we have. So the timeline for the grants was that these must be launched by summer. Um, so the essentials was here's where you can go find the resources. We would love to expand it further with a lib guide that we're hoping will also launch in the summer and just add that so that it can have a running update of here's where you can find all of this information versus here's a few quick resources that are physically located in the kit itself. We can say, go to our lib guide, which will have all of the information there. That's not live yet, um, but we are hoping that it will be ready by summer. But no, physically right now it's not in there. It is something we considered and logistically was not feasible right now, but it is something we've considered because yeah, session zero is big. Um, definitely, I will definitely share it to everyone once it goes live. Um, bouncing off that, I will say the campaign document, like when I run session zeros, I keep a little document so I know what all my players like. And I use that to do both well, they'll have friends. Like, I have a friend in town. Can they drop in? Because we're in Waterdeep. And I was like, sure. Send it to the friend. It was like, here's what everyone wants to play with this. If you don't like the sound of that, we can do a one shot or you can just drop in. Here's the group. And then between major milestones, I'll session intermissions and be like, hey, everybody, do we still like this? Do we need to reset? So yeah, the safety tools are really important and cool. I would love if we could include those more in our resources for our patrons. But yeah, right now we don't physically have them. <laughs> love an NPC BFF, yes. Of course, there's a library in my game and everyone loves the librarian's daughter, the most important character anyone's ever made. <laughs> That's so fun. All right, we've got about two minutes left. If there are any last minute questions anybody wants to throw in the Q&A, checking mine to see like if I covered all of my personal questions. Um, I guess with the last couple of minutes, would either of you like to speak about any future projects you've got either related to what you've presented today or other game related stuff? Yeah, I can, I can talk a bit for a second. Um, I am going into my dissertation studies. I'm, as a PhD student, I'm going to be uh, finishing up my area exams uh, in May. Um, but uh, the dissertation work that I'm going to be doing looks at disability and uh, how uh, the narratives within um, uh, RPG systems and the mechanics within RPG systems uh, seek to kind of like 
build it up as something as something that's I guess undesirable. Like within D and D, if you're blind or if you are deaf, there are going to be disadvantages with the way in which you navigate the world, and that makes it so that nobody wants to play a non-able-bodied character if like mechanics are important. So just kind of an overview of stuff like that. And I'm going to be looking at object texts like survival of the able uh, that kind of like uh, give off the experience, help to create the narrative, but don't project it as a uh, likelihood, um, a higher likelihood of failure just because of the disability that the character has. So stuff like that in terms of like queering failure, I guess. That sounds really cool. I love seeing the way disability gets incorporated. So good luck in your studies. Interested in those future panels. Uh, my goals here with the library is just let's keep doing this and more. I kind of touched on it in my presentation. I would love if after a year we collect a lot of data and admins like, yes, go buy more games. That would be the dream. I would love to get some campaign books, some small press. Uh, I didn't get to touch on this in the presentation, but I cannot overstate, although for our grant, we focused on peer institutions as academic libraries, a lot of the inspiration came from public libraries around the world, and specifically conversations with our local public library, the Alachua County Library District. They very kindly met with me and talked about what their infants entailed and how they selected their materials and what they wish they knew beforehand. And so they had a wish list that they shared with me of materials they would love to get and have found are useful for their in-person events, like dry erase maps. Um, since we have the 3D printers, I would love if we could print like map pieces. They're not quite fine enough for minis, but I don't know, maybe if you had a, a really big robot or something, you could try it. Um, but we have crafting spaces for painting, collaborations with clubs. I would love to just get more people and more groups trying things, even if they've never done it before or they're not sure how it's gonna work out. That way people take a chance because they're here at the library. Like it's kind of like D&D. Failure is not a bad thing here. We, we could find out something cool. Maybe we have, you know, five different campaigns or game systems in here and you're like, I've never played any of them. I'm just gonna try one. Maybe you hate it, I'm sorry. Maybe you love it and you also become obsessed with it for the rest of your life. So just having a lot of opportunity for our patrons to try and get out here and do more. Yes. Yeah, I think yes. like, <laughs> make our jobs as much about games as possible is a goal that we all share. Um, and I love all this collaboration across libraries. That's beautiful. Um, thank you all so much. This has been so fabulous. Um, we're going to put a link in the chat so attendees can give feedback to our presenters. Again, it's that short four question survey. And now you have the chance to uh, win the, uh, oh, what is it? Trains Rights Florida in Florida, TTRPGs for Trains Rights in Florida. I've already bought it. It's great. Um, so thank you all once again. And we're going to take just a minute to switch to the next session. And so our um, session 5.5, .5, since we got about 15 minutes between uh, shenanigans, is going to be us sharing the resource doc and just being like, here's some really cool things. And also why we love having a resource doc for every presentation that we um, give for conferences, for events, for um, various, uh, pretty much everything. We, we will make a resource doc because there's a lot to share. And as a roundtable, we don't have a libguide exactly. So this is can, can be a really nice way if you um, are, don't have the kind of energy to build a libguide, just going into a Google Doc, going into a Word Doc, and just putting your list of everything and then nicely tagging it is one way to do things. And so Rebecca is here to join me and talk about all of our shenanigans. Uh, I think the first thing we usually have is our virtual policy because we want that right up where everybody can see it. And it kind of gets 
clunky if we keep posting virtual policy. So I think that was one of our first moves is, I don't want to keep writing this, let's just link it. And then all of our links to our abstracts folders, you guys have already probably seen this. We do want to have a couple academic articles, um, particularly in this one, we want acad some academic articles because we know that admin can be onerous occasionally and to have actual those stats and that research that Jesse was mentioning can be all the difference when you're making your argument why you should or shouldn't have something in the library. And then we got our actual plays. So we were restrained. We restrained ourselves. We didn't put everything under the sun. We got like kind of a collection of a couple different systems and uh, a couple different um, groups because some of these groups do multiple like Dimension 20 has campaign like five or six, maybe even more campaigns, probably more. Um, but actual plays are one of the best places to start when you're going into um, just dipping your toe in when other people are dipping their toe into TTRPG land because it's one thing to have a you know 100 page book in front of you or even like a micro game but seeing other people story tell and engage with each other it just starts to click ah this is what I'm supposed to do especially those rule heavy ones I didn't know how to play a cleric uh, very well until I started watching clerics on actual plays and I was like oh I can use my powers this way okay cool I'm gonna be awesome and amazing idea sourcing <laughs> yes oh the the like my my clerical weapon doesn't have to actually be like just a weapon I can have a bust of Iune to hit somebody with knowledge yes that that will be what I'm doing from now on so lots of inspiration from actual plays love having them and giving them to uh, patrons lots of different blogs exist out there in the world I love Sly Flourish he's been one of my um, go-to's for how to DM, I, I I had no clue at all. And I was just like, I will jump in and try my very best. But Sly does a very good um, uh, kind of basic steps, how to do everything. And I love the Lazy DM's companion because- Yes, it, Lazy DM is so good. <laughs> low prep, low prep for everything. Don't worry about it. All will be well. And then I we were- like, Oh, good. I was gonna say, I feel like this entire document was an exercise in restraint because although it is 21 pages long, <laughs> it could have easily been double, triple the, the, the length that it is because there's just so many great resources out there. Oh yeah. And I think we didn't even put actual fiction books or too much we fiction because <laughs> we were like, it's literally everything, every story, it's all storytelling, find a good story and you're good to go. <laughs> but we did find uh, there are a lot of um, kind of studies of tabletop role play and how tabletop role play has been created and the cultural influences which are also really great to supplement any kind of explanation of why are we doing this thing well it's like all these amazing people said we should do this thing so let's you know jump on that delightful bandwagon and then nonfiction, like there um is kind of a growing uh market for uh, nonfiction playing aids. So things that help you kind of in not just DMing, but getting into character. I've used uh, James D'Amato's books a million times in kind of, there's a lot of character exercises. So when I'm teaching uh, how to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons, or, but it's also system agnostic, but really anything, it's like, I'll pull a couple exercises and be like, okay, we're going to do red flags, which is essentially a scenario where it gets progressively weirder and stranger and you're trying to understand when your character is going to pull out of the situation so getting deeper into character is a is a kind of uh the series of his books and then there's some really nice ones for both 5e and general like play like uncaged has amazing monsters that are diverse and from around the world it's uh i believe an any award-winning series so fantastic resources there and then our gncrt folk we love you comics <laughs> and graphic you, novel. <laughs> they did amazing work this is our major amount of fiction because graphic novels are wonderful and they went to town on this section so another thing with um our documents is usually they're group documents by the round table or the people presenting so that way you can get a lot of work done really fast and put all your brain into one thing without having to be like well what should we have it's like no no the it's the group document it lives there uh the rules are just add stuff and make it tidy 
I think one of my favorite things about the way that GameRT builds our resource documents is like when there's like three or four of us in the same document and it's just, you just see it building and building and building and everyone's ideas are feeding each other. It's like, oh, Danielle put that there, which reminds me of this thing that I now have to go grab and put in here. Yes. And then of course, there's a couple good documentaries, both on a variety of streaming platforms, but I believe the Defeat Your Demons is just on YouTube and free. So that was a fun one to watch. I enjoyed that one. <clears throat> and of course, now we're getting more and more shows that are D&D, TTRPG influence, like the entire, like every anime that's an isekai is essentially like you could just, and some of them are, they're just role-playing people who get dumped into their characters a delight but yeah we have things like legends of vox machina the guild paper girls is actually real both a comic and the uh series is a good one for if you're playing uh kids, kids on bikes. bikes yes which definitely get that uh those good 80s vibes in there and then we have a couple of channels because there is a plethora of YouTube channels to find your resources to help you in any aspect of either uh, seeing how to plays, getting reviews, getting kind of a general vibe of how the culture and the hobby is. Lots of good stuff here. We did have some session zero stuff. I was I've been adding as the sessions progress. And it's like, ooh, thank you. Ooh, yeah, thank same. you. It gets bigger. <laughs> And now kind of our pride and joy is the TTRPG section. Uh, we were adding so much <laughs> that we got to the point where I was counting everything and I was like, wait, we have almost the whole alphabet. We need to complete the alphabet. It, it needs to happen. And so you'll see A, B, C, D all the way through. We were doing pretty good till we got to the end of the alphabet. Uh, where was it? X? I was Better mad X. at X. X was so hard. We did get something though. Yes, we did. Bless you, person who made this one. There, there, I feel like there was a dropped opportunity for a lot of extreme to just use X instead of the EX. And I don't want to ever note that for anybody and put that like in a review because that seems petty. But also I'm like, make we need to make a game. We need to make a game at annual that's extreme, like some kind of unpub thing. And then I will feel that I feel a lot happier. And then, of course, we are the Games and Gaming Roundtable of all games. So we have uh, board games that also correspond with your TTRPG stuff. So uh, game night can be TTRPGs, but you can also include the board game people who are like, I don't know, what is this thing? And then slowly pull them into the dark side of stuff. It's yeah. particularly... Oh, go ahead. All the board games there are either like a hybrid board game TTRPG or it's a full board game but you are playing a character that has specific skills mm -hmm. so it's got that Eesh. character like a, feel. A five minute dungeon in particular it's only five minutes which is the light and an easy sell for anybody but you do play the cleric or the rogue or the archer it's very classic uh, five man band kind of style. And then we have newsletters. There are a couple delightful ones out there. I love Indie RPG newsletter. It is how I find anything out there because there's so many creators now from around the world. It can be hard to figure out what to collect in, what is coming up, all the different mechanics. So Indie, I think, does a fantastic job putting it all in one place for you. And then, of course, our delicious and wonderful podcast to listen to. It I sometimes prefer a podcast to an actual play, um, like watching it visually because I'm in the car or I'm doing dishes and I'm like, can't focus on the interesting interactions between persons, but a podcast sometimes is a lot easier to listen to. It is easier to listen to. I have such a hard time with podcasts though, because the thing I love about actual plays is like seeing the interpersonal mm -hmm. uh, reactions that people have, like the expressions on their face, because that feeds into a lot of the Mm -hmm. feel of the game for me I, I do agree like some podcasts that are made to be podcasts like made to be in the audio format um play a uh, play uh listen a lot better yeah because the intention was for you to just have voices and go back and forth rather yep. than I think CR has turned them into podcasts and it's just like I'm missing so much yeah and then our big tools for play. So we have a lot of safety tools in here. Um, there is, I think, the big one, this uh, TTRPG safety toolkit, if you haven't come across it, is a large uh, collection made by uh, uh, Kenia Shaw and Lauren Bryant Monk. And it is uh, just 
pretty much a ton of really great um, resources from around the uh, TTRPG sphere to be able to add and explore. And they give um, kind of credit and the origins of stuff. For, so that way you can kind of, when you're putting it in your own things, make sure to be able to credit back to the authors. And then lots of videos on session zero. And there are a ton of free resources. So speaking from our first session on free things, there are a lot of map making tools. There's word generators, there's name generators. I don't ever want to come up with names. So I'll just use the name generator <laughs> five or six times and be like, instead of, you know, Bob Placeholder, Bob Placeholder was a real person. Like well, we called him Placeholder. Um, <laughs> yes. It, it got to be nonsense, but it's nice to be able to have those lists in front of you and have something else do it. ChatGTP also, um, preview to a future thing that we're going to do with GameRT, does some interesting things with character as well. Um, Old Man Jenkins was the first NPC that chat made for me, which I don't know what that says about our um, collective consciousness of Old Man Jenkins, but <laughs> I'm delighted by it. And then we have videos on how to DM. There's a lot of great resources out there. Adventuring Academy, I think, is one of my favorite. They really go into the brass tacks of what it is to make a story and to kind of engage in this media. And let's see. Doo -doo -doo. We have a couple different character creators. And then awards. So one of the things I find very useful uh, for arguing for a particular TTRPG is definitely having an award for it and being like, it is honored by all these amazing people. And it's like, this is the prestigious Diane J Jones Award. This is why we should have it along with all of these other things. So more to add into your toolkit of why you should have particular games. And then it's also fun to discover um, the different things in the genre, because I know I get behind in the year looking for things, and I'm like, I need to catch up. What are the awards saying is interesting that have, has happened this year? And then a couple informational sites. Dicebreaker and Polygon have a ton of indie uh, reviews. They do a lot of good work making sure that you can get stuff that's happening in the uh, communities. I particularly love uh, RPGC. It is a kind of a website to explore all the RPGs that are being created in Southeast Asia and the Southeast Asian designers. And so that way, if you want to see kind of a different uh, take on uh, the genre and from a very different perspective, because some of these can get very much into kind of the colonial aspects that have happened within these countries, along with some maybe um, different themes and different ways of seeing the world, RPGC has a fantastic, uh, is a fantastic resource for uh, finding more TTRPGs. Which the word is becoming um, nonsense to me at this point. Uh, although I love it, I love everybody and every presentation, but I'm like, I've said this 10,000 times. And I think we're at five o'clock. So all the more resources, please check it out. And I will share drop screen so that way you can start the next